Um, looking more at his uh, recent activities, his DOC photos that were taken when he was reincarcerated, he has more gang tattoos now than he had when he first came into DOC in 2011. 2011, he had one tattoo, MOB, on his right arm. Presently, in 2024, he has Blood 528 tattooed on his left shoulder. He has Pueblo Bishop tattooed across his chest. He has GGA, which is the um, set he's a part of locally, tattooed on his stomach. Alan Luznet has a lot of these same tattoos as well. Then most recently, he had the phone call on 4223 that he made to Luzmat. The voice you just heard is the parole officer who is trying to get him locked back up. You may have seen part one of this, which we aired about a month ago, which was the preliminary revocation hearing, and his attorney put up a fight. This time, I think the parole officer comes in a little bit more prepared. Let's see if they're going to revoke his parole. All right, so we're going to um, review the charges again. I do want to uh, just put um, a note on record that we did have a preliminary hearing back on February 6th of 24, and there was a no finding made on charge one uh, weapons, charge two of travel, and charge four of gangs contact with members. Um, so we are going to review the, the charges that I did make findings on at the preliminary hearing, um, and then your appeal will have a chance to speak, okay? So, uh, P.O. Hey, do you have the um, notice in front of you with the charges? Yes. Perfect, okay. So charge number... Uh, charge number three, gang affiliation under gangs membership. Your PO reported? On or prior to 11-17-22 through your return to custody on 1-18-24, you have continuously claimed and or demonstrated membership in the Bloods Gang, which is a designated security risk group of the Connecticut Department of Correction. Charge number five under search, your PO reported? On 11824, you refused to provide the passcode to a cell phone that was found in your possession when your assigned parole officer asked you to provide it for the purpose of conducting a search. The same phone was used by you immediately before it was confiscated, indicating that you had access to the phone. All right, thank you. So we did put the evidence from the state on record at the preliminary hearing, so I'm not going to do that again. However, there are two new um, exhibits that the state did provide. So I have Exhibit S, which is a disciplinary report, and Exhibit T are phone notes. Um, and I also have an addendum from the state. Yo, hey, do you have a copy of that addendum? Would you mind reading it? Sure. Thank you. Um, DOC uh, Security Division reported to this officer that since Salver's present reincarceration that resulted from this violation report that he has again been in contact with Alan Lesmat number 371043, who is presently not in DOC custody, regarding ongoing politics involving the five deuce Quavo Bishop Bloods, the statuses of some of the other members, aliases were used, and potential assaults and fights between rival sets and members. On 225-24, Xavier used another inmate's phone pin to place two calls to Lesmat and spoke in Haitian Creole. A DOC staff member fluent in that language was able to translate those calls and provide a summary of them. Salvera was issued a Class A disciplinary report for SRG affiliation as a result of these conversations, which was served to him on 319.24. The DR issued 319.24 and a summary of the phone calls placed 225.24 and being submitted as exhibits S and T. This officer also spoke to members of security division about the audio of any phone calls placed by Salver or Luzmat being submitted as audio evidence and was informed that the actual recordings of the calls can only be released when there is a search warrant, subpoena, or court issue, court order issued. Uh, so therefore, that's uh, Exhibit S, the disciplinary report is being submitted, and Exhibit T, um, the phone notes, which is a translation of the phone calls that were placed on 225-24 uh, being included as evidence as well. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so that's what I have for evidence from the state. So at this time, Theo, hey, is there anything that you would like to add uh, regarding the charges um, at this time? So uh, going with charge three, gang membership, um, 
Xavier was designated on February 1st, 24. I did share that at the preliminary hearing. He's currently at SRG uh, classification level four, participating in the phase one program at Walker. Um, this uh, determination was made, the designation was made based off the same uh, evidence that's included in uh, this violation report. Um, one thing I wanted to point out uh, at the prelim, um, it was it was stated that uh, some of his photos, the time periods uh, where they were taken versus where they were posted uh, may or may not have been the same. Um, I had uh, further conversations with security division. They consider somebody posting a picture regardless of when it was taken um, as a uh, current activity. So um, anything that was posted uh, to his social media account since he's been out on parole um, is, is uh, current information based off what they concern for SRG designations. Um, one other uh, question that came up based off the evidence, um, the attorney wanted to know what uh, phone what, um, software was used to uh, download the um, phone data that was taken from uh, Salvera's phone. Um, the program is called uh, Celebrite. Um, also, there was a question about the phone not being able, the data not being able to be um, examined by the defense. Um, I would like to state that the phone is returned to the sponsor. It is in their possession. And I understand that that phone was presented to the attorney. So there's been plenty of time for discovery in this case. Um, also, uh, the attorney has the option to either um, subpoena or um, complete an FOI request uh, to get that phone data. I'm not sure if they completed that discovery, but um, that option is there. Um, jumping down to charge number five, uh, search, there was a um, kind of bizarre accusation made uh, during the preliminary hearing, which stated that uh, Severa's phone was used while it was um, in my possession. Uh, I was um, given the uh, passcode to that phone by Salvera, which turned out to be a false passcode. Um, I did mention that the prelim. Um, so I, that that just seems completely baseless. I don't I don't know um, where that came from, uh, and I have not been presented with anything really supporting that. Um, me being the one who actually provided uh, testimony at that preliminary hearing, uh, that phone was in my uh, possession. So if something happened with that phone, I don't know if uh, Silver gave his uh, I, iCloud password to somebody or if it was tampered with. Um, but. I, you know, let's saw uh, the defense has something to say on that. Um, you know, I just, I just think it's kind of concerning that they brought that up. Okay, anything else, POA? No, that's it for now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, defense, is there anything you would like to say? Uh, yes. Um, in regards to uh, charge three uh, gang membership, I'll just kind of uh, reiterate um, my argument uh, from the preliminary hearing, but I'll also encompass. Um, comments in regards to the recently submitted addendum and exhibits of S and T. Uh, the language of the rule in terms of uh, gang membership um, is that I will not associate or affiliate with any street gang, criminal organization, or any individual members thereof. And the elements are that the parolee expressly identifies as a member of a criminal organization or street gang, and the parolee repeatedly or the parolee repeatedly and continuously displays or possesses any sign symbols, colors, or items that the parolee knows or reasonably should know to be associated with a criminal organization or street, street gang, and the parolee knew or reasonably should have known that the organization or group was a criminal organization or street gang. Uh, we submit there's insufficient evidence to support this charge. Uh, the charge itself does not allege any manner in which my client is demonstrating gang membership, and again, um, I will certainly, uh, we certainly can make assumptions based on the evidence that was submitted. And I would first note that there's no evidence to, su to suggest that my client has expressly identified himself as a member of any gang. Um, he has never introduced himself in that manner or um, does not possess a membership card. Uh, secondly, there's insufficient evidence to support that my client repeatedly and continuously displays or possesses any signs, symbols, colors, or items that he, the parolee knows or reasonably should know to be associated with a criminal organization or street gang. First, the rule requires that the activity be repeatedly and continuously done. Uh, there's insufficient evidence to support this allegation. The Oxford Dictionary defines the word repeatedly as over and over again and constantly. The Oxford Dic Dictionary also defines continuously as without interruption or gaps, repeatedly without exception or reversals. In order for you to find that my client has violated, violated this rule, you must find that he repeatedly and continuously participated in the alleged activity. Analyzing the evidence, um, which I did at the preliminary hearing, 
Uh, the images that were sent to me um, initially were sent to me in black and white, and they were then uh, resent to me after the preliminary hearing um, in color. So I will indicate that. Um, exhibit F, uh, which was the Instagram photos, um, images, three of those photos were posted as uh, posted as a post and 17 of those images were posted to the story. The total posts on this Instagram account is 59 posts and those do not include the 17 images posted to the story. Thus three of the images in exhibit F are among the 59 posted images. That's 5%, 5.1% of the images that my client allegedly posted to his Instagram account are submitted, were submitted as evidence. Uh, that means 95% of the images posted are not submitted here. Um, as evidence, and I would suggest that that's because those images do not support the allegations in the PBR report. Uh, we therefore submit that there's insufficient evidence uh, to support the charge that my clients repeatedly and continuously displaying or possessing any sign symbols or colors associated with a street gang. Um, and that's because it's 5.1% um, and the rest of the 95% the um, is not present here. Exhibit K um, was five photographs. Um, the foundation of which still has not been established. They appear to be images posted from social media. Um, however, as I said, there's no foundation indicating that. Uh, there, is there is data information located on the top of the photos, but again, there's nothing submitted to show how the information was obtained. Uh, P.O. Uh, just recently testified that he believes that information was obtained uh, via cell right. Um, however, um, and just uh, suggested to me that I FOI of uh, the cell right report. Um, if, this, if there was a cell by report and, and it's available, then it should have been submitted here as evidence um, for me to review. Exhibit N is three images of which there's no foundation uh, for who took the pictures and when. Uh, the images depict uh, what looks like a bandanas. Um, exhibit O, five images. Um, if you look at the first image, it tells you that 97 images were posted to the account. However, five images are submitted here as evidence. Uh, that's five out of 97, which is the equivalent to 5.1%. So again, there are 95% of the images associated with this, this account not submitted as evidence here. Uh, again, the state fails to show that the alleged gang activity is repeatedly or continuously occurring. Exhibit P purports to be 20 images from a Facebook account. This is an account that, that contains uh, over 500 images, yet only 20 of those images are submitted here as evidence. Uh, again, that's 4%. So again, that's 96% of the images on this Facebook account that are not submitted as evidence. If my client is allegedly wearing red and showing signs of gang membership, then he's doing so in less than 5% of images associated with him or his accounts. And again, that does not establish repeated and continuous activity. Exhibit J, uh, a document that purports to be taken from my client's phone from the notes section. Again, there's no foundation linking that information to the phone. If there was a cell right extraction, I, again, I, I don't believe that it's my duty to FOI that. If it's available to the state, it should be available to me as well. Um, during the preliminary hearing, um, Theo Haight did testify that the only pictures and information obtained uh, were those that supported the state's charges, and that's why they were, those are the ones that were submitted. Um, though this is not a criminal matter, I would just point out that that admission is tantamount to a Brady violation. It's excluding, um, it's not including exculpatory, possibly exculpatory information um, if he's only using the images that support his case. Um, he's admitting that he withheld information because it didn't support his case. Um, it's, the, it's the defense's position that this is exactly why the alleged activity does not fit the language of the rule. Uh, that my client is engaging in specific behavior repeatedly and continuously because clearly there are times approximately i would say 95 percent of the time that he's not engaging in activity that fits a gang narrative um, as admitted by uh, POH. further uh, the fact that doc has classified my client as a gang member should not be sufficient evidence to support this allegation the information relied upon in that classification is the same information that's relied upon in the parole violation report it's information that uh, took place uh, while in the allegedly took place while in the community um, and is what the parole officer is charging him with. And it's not activity that took place uh, while my client was within DOC. Um, I'll address uh, the addendum. Um, when an individual is classified as an SRG member within DOC, uh, Directive 6.14 requires that the inmate be provided with a copy of the information relied upon to make that determination. 
Um, I did have discussions with my client and indicated to him that he should request uh, that information once he was designated. Uh, my client requested the information and to date has not received it. Uh, typically, an inmate being classified as SRG um, is issued a ticket alleging that gang activity. Um, at the time of my client's classification, no such ticket was issued. However, once he requested the information um, that would correspond with Directive 6.14, he was issued a ticket. And that, that ticket is included within uh, the addendum and accompanied by um, a transcript. Uh, first, the ticket alleges that my client used another individual's iPad, specifically his cellmate, to make two phone calls to an individual named Alan Lesmat. Um, as you're aware, Alan Lesmat is an alleged, alleged to be a gang member, um, and that was alleged as well in the parole violation report. Uh, my client denies this conduct and consequently did not plead guilty to the ticket. Uh, there's no evidence to support the allegations in the ticket uh, that my client, in fact, made these two phone calls. The calls were placed on an iPad that was not my client's. Uh, the state's failed to show that my client had access to that iPad at the exact time that the calls were made and that no one else had access to the iPad at those times. The calls were allegedly made to Alan Lesnat and a particular phone number uh, that the calls were made to were pro was provided. Uh, the, the state failed to submit any evidence connecting that phone number uh, beginning 614 uh, to Mr. Lesnat. There are no phone uh, records that show that the call was even placed to that number and that the number belongs to Mr. Lesmat. Uh, notwithstanding the state's failure to connect the alleged phone calls to Lesmat, I would also point out that the state provided a copy of what is purported to be a transcript of a conversation that is alleged to be recorded and in Haitian Creole. Uh, as defense counsel, I, I still believe I should have been provided with a copy of this recording. I should not be relying on a quote DOC staff members translation and summary, which is a subjective interpretation. Um, I don't know who this staff member is. Um, first, the, state's, the state has failed to prove that the alleged conversations were spoken in Haitian Creole. I haven't heard them, uh, nor have I been given the opportunity to have a certified interpreter review them. Uh, second, the state has failed to prove that my client even speaks Haitian Creole and that no one else that had access to the iPad would speak that language. Uh, they also failed to, prove, to, failed to prove that Mr. Al was not speaks that language. Regarding the translation, um, again, I have many problems with that. Who is the DOC staff member that translated the conversation? And I say, uh, at the alleged conversation, and I say alleged because I have no evidence that this conversation even took place because I wasn't provided with a copy of it. What qualifications as an interpreter do they have? Are they a certified interpreter in that language, um, in addition to being a DOC staff member? Again, I wouldn't know because I wasn't given a copy of it. Uh, the translation is not a verbatim translation. Um, it's a summary, uh, which again is subjective to the listener. Um, I could read a book and summarize that book for you, but you, when you read that book, you may have a different summary of that book. You may um, you know, pay careful attention to a specific character that I maybe didn't think was so important. Uh, so again, I think that's a very subjective thing. The person is not a certified interpreter, at least I have no documentation to support that they are, no documentation to support that this conversation took place in the language that you're telling me it took place in. Um, in my opinion, um, we shouldn't even be considering this transcript. We don't know who the author of the transcript is. We don't know their qualifications. We don't know what they were even transcribing. Um, so with all due respect, it's my opinion that's unacceptable and it's a violation of due process. Um, and I would also just, um, well, that, well that, that's, that's all I have to say um, in regards to that charge. Um, I don't believe there's, there's sufficient evidence to support uh, that charge and we would ask that you make a no finding. Uh, and again, in regards to the charge of search, I mean, I, I will just indicate that it's my client's position that the password was provided. It was not provided on the original date that uh, PO8 uh, requested it. It was provided subsequent to that. Um, originally, when the parole violation report was submitted, I believe PO8 indicated that the client was given an opportunity um, if he provided the password with a specific period of time uh, that he would not be charged with a search violation. Uh, my client did provide that password. Um, we are of the, um, it is our position that he provided the correct passcode. When I was uh, given that phone and I attempted to get into it, the phone was locked um, and it was unable, I was unable to access the phone. Uh, we do have reason to believe that during the time period that the phone was in the possession of the parole officer, 
um, that a router was ordered uh, to my client's um, girlfriend's mother's house. Um, they contacted Verizon. They were told that the that the router was ordered through the phone. I don't know have any other explanation for how a router could be ordered through a phone that wasn't in anybody's possession. That wasn't in their possession. Um, nothing further as to the charges. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, okay. Anything else? Uh, the attorney mentioned something about um, any behavior occurring inside that led to Savier's actual um, SRG designation. They did not write a DR uh, when he came back into DOC custody to designate him. They did what was called a long form designation, which is what they do uh, when gang members uh, come into DOC custody and actual gang affiliation from uh, their behavior out on the streets is used to designate them. That, that's the process that was used by security division to uh, designate uh, inmate Salvaire. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make that clear uh, that when I stated the evidence that was taken from the violation report um, that I gave to security division, they, they used um, his his actions out on the street while he was on parole to designate him. It was it was not a DR. The, the DR that he has is uh, from the um, behavior that happened inside very recently, um, which is just amazingly similar, uh, just kind of switching the players out to the behavior that basically started this whole investigation to begin with. Um, you know, Laz, Lazmat placed a call to uh, Salvier's phone um, that he had in the community. Now we have within DOC, Salvier placing calls to Lazmat's phone out in the community. Um, it's, you know, I just, I just want to clear that up. Uh, that, that's all I really have to clarify at this point. Okay, thank you. And if I can just make one last comment. Um, I believe that the unit where uh, Mr. Savier is being held um, is all um, alleged Bloods members. Um, so all of those members are alleged to be Bloods members. Um, Alan Lesman is alleged to be a Blood member. That sounds to me like any one of those individuals would have um, a reason to contact him, but it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that any anybody else there would have contacted him. They're all, they're all alleged to be members of the same gang. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, um, the, the determination was made by security division that it was uh, Salavera that uh, placed those calls. Um, they're very familiar with these individuals, who they are, uh, the nicknames they use for each other, um, the rank structure, who would contact who, and uh, that determination has uh, definitely been made by um, people who are very knowledgeable on both Salvia and Les Pat. Okay. Anything else? No. Okay. Thank you. So charge number three, gangs membership. I am making a finding of preponderance of the evidence, finding a violation based on evidence provided by the state, specifically the documents that were provided regarding the gang membership, the photos, um, the documents from Mr. Savare's phone. Uh, charge number five of search. I do make a finding a preponderance of the evidence that there was a violation regarding this charge based on evidence provided by the state and testimony as well regarding the um, not giving uh, Mr. Sauvera not giving um, P.O. Hate the password for his cell phone. All right, so that concludes the fact finding portion of the hearing. Is there anything else you want to say regarding background, history, anything you want me to consider before I make a recommendation for a sanction? P.O. Hey, hey, go ahead. Yes. So um, I did receive uh, yesterday at uh, 2 p.m. the defense exhibits uh, plans for um, reinstatement. Um, I read through that. Uh, I, Listen, I, I believe everything uh, Sylvia put on there that um, they, they said that he's going to go back to his job. Um, he's going to go take care of his daughter. He's giving me no reason to uh, believe he's not going to do those things. 
Um, although plans for reinstatement, that sounds kind of premature. There is a finding here, and we're probably looking at a future reparole date. Uh, what I didn't see on there is that he's going to refrain from any uh, future gang affiliation, and um, I, I don't believe there's any, uh, he has intention of not doing that. Um, I, I see him going back right into this. Um, just want to, uh, you know, give you some history on uh, Salver. Uh, when he first came to my caseload in August of 22, uh, he moved to the city of Norwalk. He, he seemed like he was doing everything right. Um, he had a really good job. Uh, you know, he got some travel passes from me. He was able to travel. Um, he was always respectful, polite. Um, you know, I mean, I, I look forward to him coming in. He, he was a good guy to talk to. But, you know, as they say on the uh, streets, he talked a good one. Um, all that changed uh, April 19th when uh, Security Division reached out to me and let me know that um, he was, uh, they had him on the phone talking to Luzmat. Um, you know, at the time, I, I didn't think they had the right guy because uh, he, he seemed like he was doing everything right. But, um, you know, I did inmate search. There was only one Salvaire in all the DOC, so uh, it, it was him. And, um, you know, even at the time, I never even realized how high up he was in the Bloods gang. Um, even when we did the compliance check, got his phone the first time, did the phone dump. Uh, it keeps coming more and more clear how, how high up he is in this organization. Um, you know, now we keep mentioning the, the repeated and continuously uh, criteria that the board uses for uh, Connecticut parole condition number four, um, per statutes, we only have six standard parole conditions everybody gets. There's a whole condition dealing with gang affiliation. And from what I can see, he has been in violation of that condition every single day since his special parole started. Um, now going into the uh, Pueblo Bishop Bloods and what their members do, um, they, they, they commit crimes to uh, further um, control of territories and uh, to gain money and guns for um, continuous gang activities. Now, Salver, he is, his incident offense, he has uh, three B felonies that were committed um, within a month of each other, uh, two robbery first and one assault first. Um, Salvier so stated in his uh, first parole hearing when he was going to get parole that he has been part of the blood since he was 15 years old. So he would have been a bloods member when he was committed to these crimes. Um, based off of the notes taken off of his phone, he would have ranked as a BG or a baby gangster around that time, which is where gang members are to commit crimes such as robberies, assaults, type of uh, crimes that got uh, Salvier so um sentenced in the first place. Um, if you look at his associate, who we're well familiar with from these hearings, Alan Luzmat, um, who currently ranks as an OG in the uh, organization, um, he's had assaults and weapons charges since 2009 and is presently a suspect in the Park Avenue shootings that occurred in Bridgeport August 22nd, 2023, and he is out on a half million dollar bond. Um, these aren't petty crimes that this organization commits. These are these are big ticket crimes that uh, I attend the Bridgeport PD Intel meetings every single week. This was a serious shooting that took place in August. And this was Salvaire's OG who committed, excuse me, is suspected of committing that shooting. Um, since Salvaire came out, it appears he's been promoted to a YG, a young gangster, um, whose job is to obtain guns and money for the gangs. Um, not sure how he's committing money for the gangs, but during this investigation, I was kind of uh, taken back to notice that his sponsor was applying for a pistol permit. I don't know if that is to further getting uh, guns for the gang through straw sales, but that was a real concerning piece of information for me to uncover. Um, as I stated, prior to his uh, parole hearing in early 2021, uh, Salvador stated he's been part of the blood since he was 15. He was affiliated with them up into his incarceration for his incident offense in 2011. Um, he was designated shortly after that, April 2nd, 2012, and he was housed on the SRG units in DOC until March 20th of 2014. That's over two years. He came back to general population less than a year, excuse me, less than two years later, they find a um, blood history hidden in a greeting card in his property. He's designated again. Designated as a blood member from December 9, 2015 to January 3rd, 2018. Fast forward, Savier goes up for parole. 
He's asked to state what he um, learned while he was in the SRG unit. And this is a direct quote that is in Salvier's parole application. He said, gangs aren't what they seem. It's a false family and it's all fake. OK, that was those were his words at the time. He comes back out, looks like he goes right back into it. Um, his special parole, which is, is the uh, crucial date that we need to consider any behavior for, was uh, September 30th, 2022. He was making social media posts right around that time, indicating that he was in violation of condition four of his parole agreement for his entire time on special parole until he was reincarcerated. Also, I submitted a CST on Salvier 223-23, where the question about gang membership was asked, have you ever been or are you now part of a gang? He reported, no, never. So Salvier has hidden his um, gang affiliation from parole for his entire time of, um, while on supervision. Uh, looking more at his uh, recent activities, his DOC photos that were taken when he was reincarcerated, he has more gang tattoos now than he had when he first came into DOC in 2011. 2011, he had one tattoo, MOB, on his right arm. Presently, in 2024, he has blood 528 tattooed on his left shoulder. He has Pueblo Bishop tattooed across his chest. He has GGA, which is the um, set he's a part of locally, tattooed on his stomach. Alan Luznat has a lot of these same tattoos as well. Then most recently, he had the phone call on 4223 that he made to Luznat. I'm sorry, excuse me. 4223 was the call that Luznat placed to Salvier while Salvier was out on um, out on parole. Um, social media accounts uh, have been posted too the whole time he was out on supervision. They are still up today. They kind of stand as a billboard for his uh, gang affiliation. And um, I'm sorry, one second. The 225-24 calls were the most recent calls that uh, were made from either between Soviet and Lozmat that we know of. Uh, Salvier used his cellmate's pin, called Lozmat twice the same day, spoke Christian heel, excuse me, Haitian Creole, used names, talked about fights, assaults within DOC and out on the streets, and politics between rival sets and leadership within his own gang. If he's found guilty of this DR, he's going to have to start phase one over, which means he will actually have completed less of the SRG program than he had when we were at the preliminary hearing a couple months ago. Um, so that's the reason why I'm asking for him to serve at least uh, one year sanction. Um, the last two times he was uh, designated as SRG member, it took him almost two years or more than two years to complete the SRG program. I think that going through at least phase one and phase two would be beneficial for his possible return um, to parole supervision. Uh, I'd also like to ask for no contact with Alan Lesmat or uh, Victor Arroyo, who was uh, Salvier's so cellmate, whose pin he used to contact Luzmat. Um, and just to sum up, like I said, I don't think he uh, has any uh, intention of um, not reaffiliating with this gang when he comes back out as he stands today. I also don't think he has a choice. Uh, I think they're going to be after him as soon as he gets out there. So um, what I will say to uh, Salvier today, if um, you came back on a parole today and you told me that you were looking at going interstate, that's something I would support and that's something that I would recommend. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Defense, anything you wanna say? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my client is 32 years of age. Um, he's single, um, though he's been in a relationship uh, with his, his significant other for the past 14 years. Um, he's a high school graduate. Uh, he has a three and a half year old daughter. Um, when he was recent, when he was, uh, First released a discretionary parole in July of 2021. He was sponsored by his mother um, in Stanford, and then he uh, moved uh, to be sponsored by his significant other, um, and that was also in Stanford. Um, while on uh, supervision, he successfully completed uh, the New England Tractor Trailer Training School. Uh, he does hold his CDL, uh, and he's received his tanker endorsement. Uh, he worked jobs uh, while he was in school, working at full time at Whole Foods as uh, well as part time at Burlington. Um, in addition, he worked full time at Western Express, and most recently, uh, his employment uh, was working full time at City Line Distributors. Um, and there is a letter um, 
from his employer that is attached as a defense exhibit to uh, which uh, generally indicates that he was a valuable employee and that that job uh, is waiting for him uh, when he is reinstated. Um, upon reinstatement to parole, he would like to be sponsored uh, by his significant other um, and her information is contained uh, within defense exhibit one. Um, he's eager to return to the community, continue to build his career, um, would like to obtain his hazmat endorsement. Uh, he's eligible again to return to his full-time position at City Line Distributor. Um, and that's located in West Haven, um, and he does aspire uh, to create his own logistics and trucking uh, business in the future. Um, again, he's eager to reunite with his uh, daughter, who's only three and a half months old. Um, we would ask, uh, this is his first violation of uh, parole supervision. Um, he was out in the community for approximately two and a half years uh, while on supervision and was able to accomplish uh, many things. Um, and if I could just make one comment as to, um, the comment that P.O. Hate made regarding uh, his significant other getting her pistol permit. I will just note um, that I, I believe that's her business if she wants to get a pistol permit. I don't think that has anything to do with my client. Um, she is an individual with no criminal history um, and she's a physician's assistant. So she has a very, um, she's very educated. She has a very good job. And I, I don't think she would very much would appreciate uh, the suggestion that she has any criminal um, uh, endeavors uh, uh, in her future. Um, so I would, just, I would just point that out. We are asking for reinstatement to parole um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Mr. Salver does want to go to, he wants to sponsor to the significant other's address, correct? Um, I know, correct me if I'm wrong, POA, but I think PCS would have to do a home investigation anyways on that. And I think the, if there was a weapon in the home, that would prevent him from being a spawn, being yeah, she doesn't have a weapon. Oh, okay. Okay. She, okay. Just, she was just, um, she had just made out. Oh, to get okay, the okay, okay. And I believe yeah, at this point uh, it has been approved for the permit, but I, well, I think, I mean, PCS still has to do a home investigation. So that would be, I mean, that's on them of what the, if she was approved or not. Um, is there a yeah, second choice? Um, is there a second choice placement for spot being sponsored? Um, Hold on, Pio. Hey, um, Kevin, would the second would your second choice for a sponsor be your mother? Yeah, it's my mother. Okay. So, go ahead, Pio. Hey. Sorry, I just wanted to point out that when we did our compliance check back in October, we recovered two um, NRA pistol targets. Uh, that was that was just the information that kind of led to the fact that the sponsor was going for the pistol permit. Um, you know, I'm not accusing her of anything. I just think it's uh, pretty concerning that, um, you know, we have evidence that uh, Savier is supposed to provide guns to his gang and that his significant other would be able to potentially uh, commit straw purchases for him. But um, I'm not really uh, stating that's what they plan on doing. I'm just saying that is a concern of ours. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. So I, I mean, I have a ton of information here from the preliminary hearing and today. I know there's we've had a lot of conversation regarding these two charges, the, um, the gang membership and also the search. I did make findings of violation on both of them based on the evidence provided. Um, the, you know, I look at the addendum and the new evidence that was provided as aggravating information. I know he didn't um, plead guilty to that. It sounds like he's still, is that correct? He's still going through the process with yes. the DR? Yes, okay. Um, I do consider that uh, aggravating information. Um, he's getting a new DR while he's already in custody for this violation, um, which is a concern of mine. Um, I cannot ignore the fact that Mr. Saver has been on parole supervision for two and a half years, um, which is a lot longer than what I normally see guys out in the community for, and he has no prior violations. So I can't ignore those two things. Um, I know you're asking for the year sanction. Um, uh, and he would he even complete the program for the year sanction by then? Like, would he complete the program in... Um, January of next year? 
Well, like I said, the last two times I took him uh, two years ago from an SRG4 to an SRG2. Um, okay. Most likely he would be able to com uh, complete phase one and phase two within that time period and be reduced to phase three. Okay. All right, let me look at my calendar. Hold on one second. So I'm going to make a recommendation. I do recommend your parole be revoked and that you're re-paroled on July 18th of 24, which is a six month sanction with the conditions of no contact with co-defendant Timothy Robinson and Jamar Rowe. General no contact with Alan Lussmat, number 371043. And also, um, Victor Arroyo, do you have an inmate number for Victor Arroyo? I, I do, one second. Okay. Uh, 434-466. 434-466. Four three four four six six. Um, so also no contact with him. Uh, general no contact with People's Bank, three twenty eight Shippen Avenue in Stamford, Connecticut, including employees A M A H N R P S and B Z. For your convenience, grocery store at one thirty five Prospect Street, Stamford, Connecticut, and K K. All right, so what's going to happen now is that I am going to put this case in front of a panel of the board. That will be not next week, the week after, I believe it's the 18th. Um, yes, so it'll be April 18th. I'm going to put this in front of the board. The board makes the final decision. The board can either accept my recommendation of the six months, the re-parole for July. They could give you a lesser sanction. They could re-parole you as soon as the 18th or they could want you to have a longer sanction. If they want you to have a longer sanction, they have to give specific reasons why they want a longer sanction and you would be brought back in front of them for another hearing, okay? <laughs> Mr. Salvador, do you have any questions for me? Um, no questions. Okay, so this concludes the revocation hearing for Kevin Salvador, number 366186. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pew Hate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Sonia. Thank you for everything. You're welcome. You can call if you have any questions, okay? Okay. Pretty surreal to see that this is the same person just back in 2011. The first crime, I think, maybe that uh, Richard was able to find on his record, at least in the past, um, that where he was alleged, alleged to have shot a high school age kid in, in the leg. Uh, but hey, does time fly? And you know, these, these parole revocation hearings are certainly interesting. Now, what's going to happen is that they're going to bring it now to the final, the big boss, who's going to look at the recommendation made at this parole hearing. And they're going to, like she said, either they're going to agree to the six-month sanction or, and if they have to add more time, that will be another hearing. That would be a third hearing. So unlike Louisiana, here in Connecticut, you have your preliminary hearing. You then have your next hearing, which could be the last hearing or you could actually have a third hearing. They have all these layers. Then they have it where pretty much anyone can get an attorney. And these attorneys, they're impressive. I mean, I from what I've seen, they're all really impressive. 
and they, they just you know aren't the, what you do what i think a lot of us kind of expect from from a public defender especially one at like a revocation hearing but they have their own division they have their own attorneys assigned simply for for parole revocations why Connecticut does that, I'm not sure. Is it because they, they, you know, it could be the ideology, the thought process that, hey, we can have, if we can reduce the number of revocations, it increases our stats and data. I mean, I don't know the reason. I like the idea of it, but at the same time, I think it comes with a lot. Um, the parole officers in Connecticut, they, they don't just have to worry about being parole officers. They basically need to be attorneys themselves. I mean, if you saw the preliminary hearing, how, how, um, you know, the prior one, and even now they have to come really at the level to uh, battle against trained attorneys. That's, that's pretty mind boggling to me. That's it's, it's just, gosh, it's a lot on their plate. And then the next thing that came to my mind is I was, I was wondering, I said, can you imagine being a parole officer and revoking someone who you are certain is a bloods gang member would you not be afraid for your safety so i ran you know an ai search and the actually the results came back that uh parole officers um in in the us and in connecticut have a very low rate of um on job fatalities uh i think it was it's close to zero they said and um, which is interesting. I guess it's just one of those positions that I don't know. I, I would have maybe it's just one where where people are, you know, he, he's smart enough to know not to mess with with them. You know, it's like it's part of the game, I guess. There's certain things you do and certain things you don't do. Um, but man it was interesting he's bringing up the tattoos that he the new tattoos he has and from the last hearing i read the comment section many of you brought up how he has his eye drop tattoo and that means he's killed someone um i've always wondered about that you know if that's if that could somehow be used against you but he didn't bring it up in this in this hearing as a new tattoo or even as or as anything at all um it seems pretty clear to me from what we've seen that he's an active bloods member i mean that's and the idea that all he got was a six-month sanction is a little bit shocking to me um yes i get that he's been doing well on parole but how do you properly fight crime i guess it, it really is a battle you just can't you just can't win <laughs> But, you know, I, I could only imagine that a six month sanction, as far as his perspective, would be a, would be quite a victory. Um, it's just part of the game, right? It's part of the process. And six months is hardly a slap on the wrist. And then you hear there that they they even have them all housed together. I wouldn't have thought that you would house all the bloods together. That sounds, again, like you're just putting everyone in an area where they can collaborate and hang out and grow tighter and and get more indoctrinated but what do i know i'm just a man do it was it was interesting watching he's got quite a poker face um there's a few times when he he expressed himself but from what i've seen from these gangs these gangs are scary as heck and uh It certainly this is not there's no way it's like oh well let's send him to a program and then he's going to learn to denounce the bloods but but let's keep him housed with all of his fellow gang members and and let's all have them take programs together so they can be re-educated and and live a straight and narrow uh life and it's like um yeah that that's brilliant connecticut that's really makes a lot of sense you know i know we don't have our phds i know that we we're not that smart. We're just regular. We're just like the regular, you know, citizens. Um, but if we were to take that risk and venture outside and think and 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 dare to suggest that maybe things be run differently, um, I might I might suggest 
that the six month sanction on a hardcore gang member is, is not going to change anything. All it brings is just this tremendous cost to the state, to the taxpayer. And it's a game that they are, that they are much better at playing, that they are willing to play and, a, and, a, and a game that we are clearly losing, but what do I know? The reason I'm not going through everything else and all the other information is we did it on the prior hearing. I'll put the link to that one in the description if you want to see it. And if he does come back for a third hearing, we'll make sure to play it here. Thank you, Richard, for the info. And with that, I'll let you go.